Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Software. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 202 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in St. Louis. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. In our last episode, we went back to the future and discussed document assembly and why lawyers should take a fresh look at it. People often tell us that we seem to be technology cheerleaders and like just like everything tech. Au contraire, we each have some tech pet peeves. And Tom used to do a regular podcast segment called Tom's Rant, in which he ranted about something in tech that just drove him crazy. We both had a few things recently that have really bugged us, and we've decided to air those and see if you agree. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, we will indeed be letting some steam off and ranting about some of our biggest technology pet peeves. In our second segment, we'll talk about a great tip that we got on our listener voicemail about uh, our recent Document Assembly podcast. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. Uh, But first, technology annoyances. I am... I, I, you're right. We used to have a segment, and I want to say that it wasn't really called Tom's Rant. I want to th- say it was just called The Rant. Um, but it seemed like there was always something getting me going. And I've kind of mellowed out, I think. But um, maybe it's just that everything has built up, that there are things that get us about technology, um, about whether it doesn't work or, or whether the people around us don't use it the way they should or whatever it happens to be. And so I thought this was a great idea for a podcast that we just sort Sort of uh, let some steam off. Talk about some of the things that, that bother us about technology, and then uh, and then maybe follow that up uh, the next podcast with something a little more enlightening and optimistic. What do you think, Dennis? What's been bugging you lately? Well, first on my list, Google Maps, and especially for walking directions oh, when, I, when I'm you traveling. Have no idea how much that bothers me. Oh my God! It's just so I've been to th- on three trips recently, and like the worst part of every trip was my Google Maps experience. And you know, there's even part of me that would say, "Well, you know, maybe it's my fault. You know, maybe I'm doing something wrong by just putting in the starting point and the ending point and not being able to figure out what's happening." But I was with other people, and we end up going the wrong direction, and you know, and having trouble finding where we were. And I was in London recently. And I actually wished I would have just had a paper map uh, at, at some points, but it's just the weirdest the weirdest thing because you'll be walking along and I just there's like three or four times I said, you've arrived at your destination. I would go like, my destination is nowhere around here. And then I would like, redo it you know just put in like this my current location to the starting point i wanted and we go like oh it's 0.3 miles away i'm like i don't even understand what's going on here this is no help to me i i this is as close as i've ever come to just saying look just give me a paper map and and go forward with it so i don't know i mean a lot of people seem to like google maps i i it makes me feel like they use it in cars or something, but walking, oh my God, it's just the worst thing. So that's that's my big one these days. And I don't know that there's a great answer there, but God, I'm just, I'm just, anything I can do to move away from Google Maps, especially while I'm walking. And then the other thing I would say is that it does this weird thing where I just think the big improvement would be if it just tell you like, right away that you're walking in the wrong direction. Um, that is exactly <laughs> it. That's it. Because I was going to say that, that the problem you describe is not the problem that I have. It's it's when I first start out, the arrow in your direction, it, it just kind of floats and it doesn't float in the exactly the right direction and you could start walking and then you're half a block down or a block down and all of a sudden you realize, oops, I walked in the wrong way and everybody has to turn around. And it is, yeah, that's the worst part is that it doesn't have any service Certainty. It doesn't feel, you know, that car maps is a good, I think, a good solid product and being able to navigate in a car, that's great. But when you're walking, it just doesn't feel very confident of where you are. It just can't pinpoint you down to the foot where you happen to be. 
When also the like the time it's telling you it takes you to get to where you're going always seems like it's moving around. You're like, oh, I'm only four minutes away, and then you like walk another couple blocks. You go like, oh, I'm only seven minutes away, and, <laughs> and so <laughs> it's like I don't, I don't, I don't get it. But anyway, I I uh, actually spent a day in London walking 15 miles total, and most of the time I was. Google Maps had me confused most of the way I traveled, so it probably added a couple miles onto my to my walking that day. So, Tom, what, what do you have? All right, so mine is actually more about tech journalists than anything else, and this has been getting under my skin for a while now, and it kind of bubbled over in the past month or so. If you've been reading the news, or even if you haven't, all the new phones have come out. I am, as most people who listen to this podcast know, a big Android fan, and especially of the Google Pixel. I was very excited about getting the new Google Pixel, and I had ordered it, and it was in the mail when suddenly stories started coming out about problems with it looked like the screen looked kind of blue if you turn it a certain way and there was screen burn in that shouldn't be there that early and maybe the the speakers make this weird screeching noise if you try and record audio and suddenly journalists were withdrawing their reviews and saying you really shouldn't buy a phone like this and i got my phone and it was just fine. I have no problems with it. But even if I did have problems with it, uh, Google immediately came out and tried to make it as right as they could. They, they fixed by software everything they could fix. And if you still have problems, they will replace your phone for free, no questions asked. And, uh, you know, I, Google's trying to get into the hardware business and, all oh, right, they're going to stumble a little bit. Another company had phones that exploded all the time and, and they're doing just fine right now. But it's amazing how journalists go crazy crazy about something like this. And I think that they can really influence people in a way that's not really helpful or useful about whether the technology is still worth having or purchasing. The other thing I'll talk about with journalists is, is that they seem to live in a bubble that the use for which people will have with technology only applies to the things that they do as journalists. And so they all talk about how, oh, really, you only need a, an iPad to be productive. You don't really need to do anything else. They don't recognize that that the, the huge number of people who work in companies that live in spreadsheets all the time, that actually have structured databases and systems, and they talk about things as if they really only need to uh, have a good note-taking app on their iPad, and that's all anybody really needs to be productive in their job. And it's really very frustrating because they seem to not really take into consideration how other people live or use technology. And maybe I'm just listening to the wrong tech journalists or reading the wrong tech journalists, but it just seems like they're not helpful to the average tech user. Well, and I also think that People want to file these reviews and and draw traffic from the beginning, so they're always well, that's part of it too. You know, yeah. nitpicking something, and so we had this great idea. I mean, it's totally impractical, but I just I like the idea that you would actually review phones after you'd had it for a year or so. Because then that you would actually know something about it. And, and it, some people do that. I've seen some reviews where they've said, you know, six months in or three months in or something like that. I've seen those reviews, and I and I give some of those people credit for that sort of thing. But um, I still don't think that most journalists get a pass on that. And the early software reviews, I think, are also, uh, you know, go our app reviews are also that way because you, you get exactly what you're talking about is that somebody has their own – you know, perspective on things like yep. you and I do when we talk about things, but but then they sort of universalize that, and you go like, well, actually, what they're talking about doesn't matter to me one bit. Yeah. All right, Dennis, what's up for you? Um, so this one comes up a lot because I'm on Skype calls and conference calls, voice over IP, which is just the best example of this. But it's when people kind of give you the, like, I think this is a user error, or I don't think you know what you're doing when this happens. And so if you're on a conference call and then your network connection is really bad, I mean, obviously it is not user error. It's like a network issue. So I, I've, I find all these things are you go like hey my computer crashed when i did this it's like well you must have done something wrong and i'm like well, you know there's really nothing you can do that's wrong that's going to crash your computer and there's nothing that you can do that's going to cause a blue screen of death on a, on a windows machine so it's i don't really feel that's operator error but i think that that's kind of this thing where you go i don't know you say to me 
every call I'm on, every conference call I'm on, it always seems like somebody has an issue. And I'm not going like, oh, my God, this person just does not know how to use Skype because they're, they sound terrible or they're dropping the calls or something. And so, so I think that I, I just find that people have a lot, you know, if, they're really impatient and they're, they have a tendency to say, oh, this is something you're not doing right. You know, so it's a user error, uh, which can be the case in some things, but sometimes you got to step back and go like, hey, look, it, it's not a user error. There's just a system problem or a network problem and you need to give people a little bit of a break. I think that there are way too many ways that users can mess up a Skype call that it becomes easy to also blame the actual technology issues on the user as well. Um, but I think you're right. I think that there are a lot of, um, uh, you know, it, it's become sort of the fashionable thing to say that if something goes wrong with technology, it's because somebody really just doesn't know how to use it or they're using it improperly. And unfortunately, I mean, I, I'd like for that to be the case. I'd like for technology to work perfectly and all the time. But uh, that's really not not uh, you know realistic at this point. So I, yep, I, th I wish I wish people would give others a break a little bit more often, or at least think through what they're actually saying when they when they're blaming poor network quality on the user. All right. So my next one, actually, you preemptively brought it up in your last rant, and and that is um, the blue screen of death. And and I never thought that in 2017 I'd really be talking about it because Microsoft has has improved Windows so much in my opinion, to, to the fact where I thought the blue screen of death was a thing of the past. And I have been a big fan of the Surface devices that Microsoft has put out. But I'm really starting to believe that they have some hardware issues that need to get fixed because I've never had so many blue screens of death since, I don't know, Windows 95? What was after that? Windows Vista? I continually get blue screens of death on my uh, Surface laptop. In fact, today I was on a conference call call on a video call and all of a sudden blue screen of death completely shut down my whole computer I lost everything that was on it and had to had to start over again on a document that I was doing I don't know why that is I don't know why Windows can't get that stuff right it doesn't make sense to me and for that matter I'm also noticing I tie this together loosely because they're both Microsoft products is I have the Excel version on, on Office 365 and I noticed that it crashes constantly. And I don't know if that could be user error for all I know, but I don't think that it is. And it is constantly having problems and having to restart. And I don't save it often enough and I lose data. And I don't know if it's a quality control issue that Microsoft's having with these now and that there's something going on. But I I've got to say, I've been a Windows and a Microsoft fan uh, because they do things that, that tend to be getting better. But this is just not better. You know, I had the Windows Surface thing where I was, uh, I just brushed my finger against the screen, actually while I was on a Skype call, and, and uh, got the blue screen of death. And, and somebody said, well, what did you do to cause that? And I'm going, <laughs> I, I well, literally I did nothing to cause it. Believe me, if, if like touching your finger to the touch screen causes a blue screen of death, then I admit well, that I'm guilty of that. I will, but I will I say I've caused that. I, I will say I've gotten a couple of blue screens while I was scrolling with my finger, while I was swiping. And so I think there might be something to that. There is something in the video drivers that can't handle the swiping, but that's not user error. That's. <laughs> That's it's it's you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It, they built it so you could swipe on the screen. So no matter whether you touch it intentionally or not, that's not something that should be happening. Okay, so my next one is iPhone charger cords, and I probably have a dozen of them in the house, and I never know whether one is going to work or not. And I sort of end up buying them in packs of threes, you know, and I'm thinking about buying them in packs of sixes. And so they they tend to fray. Sometimes they don't work. Sometimes you need to put use them with a, an adapter. Sometimes you can put them in a USB slot. You know, I, I never know what to expect. Um, they fray a lot. There was a great, I forget who did this, but it was just great. Uh, what they said, talk about Steve Jobs and how he wants everything to be perfect and, you know, that the device has to be perfect. And they were showing like the USB charger cord that was all frayed near the end. I was going, yeah, that's the problem with these things. And so I don't know 
what the deal is, and and maybe it does come down to the the fact that you're buying cheap power cords, uh, and that's that becomes part of the problem. But I've done things like with the Kevlar and the special coating and stuff, and they'll fray or they'll s- stop working, and it's just uh, you know kind of a bigger hassle than it needs to be. And I guess Tom, I know that part of the your answer and and part of my answer, I hope in the future is is going to be this you know wireless charging but i just never know what to expect with the these cords anymore actually my answer is going to be go to android because the cords that i use i actually use google cords and they are i think extremely high quality i haven't had any fraying issues in years with this since i've actually since i've gone to android i use either the google cords or anchor a n k e r has some good cords um there if, for those of you who are on android devices uh, there's a guy out there i'll see if i can find the link who regularly tests them to make sure that they're good quality good charging cords but um I'll tell you, that's something that I really can't share in that in that particular rant because uh, I haven't had that issue since I gave up my iPhone a long time ago. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna rant about it. It's another people issue, but it has to do with technology and it has to do with um, with using email. And and you know, I think on this podcast, Dennis, you and I have talked on many occasions about how email is a collaboration tool, but it's probably not the collaboration tool we choose if we had the chance to use something different. And I'm starting to use different tools in different places with people to collaborate. Um, but I'm finding that even when you go in to use those tools, they still want to talk to you in email and still want to have conversations in email. And I'm going to give an example, and I'm going to leave a name out because, Dennis, you and I both know this person. But I I belong to a group. We're using a Slack account for our communications. Um, I posted two major things and said, here's what I've done. I've done X, Y, and Z. I did some edits to a document and I I formatted the document in a certain way and I explained, here's why I did it. And here's what you're seeing when you look at that. And I put that into Slack. And probably about 10 days later, one of the people in the group emails me and he says, I just looked at the document. It's got all these mistakes in it. What's going on, Tom? I mean, why did you do it this way? Why did you format it in this particular way? And my response to him was to cut and paste out of it all of the stuff that I had put into Slack and to email it to him. And there was not any recognition that there was using this other thing. And I it, it drives me crazy. If we choose a tool, I want to use the tool. And maybe I'm being a little authoritarian about the whole thing. And maybe that's unrealistic of me to expect that that happens. But I feel like if we're trying to be more productive by using a single tool, then we, by gosh, we ought to stay on the same tool. I think that's uh, that is that is a big one, and I was just thinking how like in what we've done recently in re- doing the second edition of our collaboration book. I can't even remember the last time we that we sent an email to each other um, in connection with the, with the with the if, book. If we're talking to other people, that's the only time. Yeah. So my last one is uh, probably the most controversial one, but I've just started to get tired of of lawyers who still don't want to learn tech. I mean, it's like 2017, almost 2018. There's a thing that uh, I've been hearing a lot too is that lawyers say, "Oh, this this whole thing with data analytics and stuff like that." I, you know, I don't do math. I didn't. I went to law school because I don't want to do math and this data stuff and just too much like math. And I'm just kind of like, I don't get it, you know, because this stuff is not that hard to learn. And I can't really say like, oh, you know, like, oh, some some area of law changed since I went to law school. So I'm not going to bother to learn it because I don't do that. You know, like, so when I was in law school, the condominium movement was just kind of starting, especially in Washington, D.C. And I sort of feel like some lawyer would go like, wait a second. I'm not learning this condominium stuff. You know, I know real property, I know buying houses, and I know renting. And this condo stuff, forget it. I'm not going to learn it. And so you would never do that in substantive law. And, and then we're talking about the tools that you actually use. And so I, I just don't – it just – 
boggles my mind these days to to hear lawyers say, I, you know, I can't learn that. I don't want to learn that. You know, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm still happy, happiest when we were back before we did this technology. You know, give me a give me a legal pad and a pen or the good old U.S. mail. I, you know, I've heard all that stuff recently and I just go like, it's sad to me. And I know, Tom, you and I can sometimes have this different approach where you're like, no, we need to pe- teach people these things. And I'm like, no, I kind of feel like it's time to leave these people behind. And so, you know, maybe we'll talk about that in a future podcast. But God, you know, lately when I hear people who don't want to learn technology with the stuff that's starting to happen right now in technology and the impact it's going to have, it just it just blows my mind. Well, you know, so you're ranting about me to a certain extent because being the liberal arts major that I was, I really don't want to learn about data analytics. It is hard to me. It is something that my mind just doesn't completely wrap around. But what I'm thinking of when you're ranting like this is the Dilbert cartoon that came out, gosh, it's probably been about a week now, November 7th, it came out where a guy pops around the corner of the office to the pointy-haired boss. He says, I see you're off the phone. Can I pop in and ask a quick question? And the boss says, yes, but only if it's quick. Oh, oh, it will be quick. Okay, make it quick. And the guy asked the question, what is blockchain and how will it influence our strategy across all product lines? And I thought, I'm exa- that's exactly how I feel about blockchain is that's a, not a quick question and it's not a quick answer, but I want a quick answer to that. And yeah, I know there's a video you can point me to that'll teach me about blockchain in two minutes and I get that. But this is one area where I sort of feel a little bit of sympathy for those who don't want to learn about it. And it's not that I don't, it's that it's hard. I think it is hard to learn. And I, you know, for someone who's, uh, whose recurring nightmare is waking up on the morning of a final exam for a class I didn't go to all semester. Just the thought of having to learn something new is, it's not really terrifying to me, but it's not the thing that I want to do as I get older. And I guess they're that old dog, new tricks thing. Um, But I do think that there's a point to say, if we plan as lawyers to remain competitive and provide as good a service as we can to our clients, I think it really does pay that we learn as much as we can. So uh, I sort of grudgingly get your rant and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll accept it at least for the time being. And I'll just remind you of the opinion you had with the people who wouldn't uh, learn Slack just a few minutes ago. No, it's not that they won't learn Slack. It's that they won't use Slack. I'm okay with people who don't want to learn Slack because I will, like you said, I will bring them along slowly and teach them how to do it. It's the people who refuse to use it because they believe that email is a superior tool. Totally different, completely different subject there. So, all right, my last rant is actually similar to yours, Dennis, but with a very, with a more specific thing. And that is lawyers and people in general who don't want to use password managers. It drives me absolutely crazy to hear my friends and lawyers in particular talk about the fact that it's just so hard now. I have to know a separate password for every site, and this site will only let me do a 12-wheeler password, but this one is requiring 16, and this one will only let me do it with without a symbol, but the other one I can do symbols on, and it expects to have a symbol. And boy, my gosh, it's so hard to keep track of all these, and so I have three different passwords that I use for these sites. And all I can say is if you just have a password manager and learn how to use it, you never will complain about this again. I don't have these complaints. I go to the website. My password manager fills it in for me. It's easy. It works both on the web. It works on my phone. I never have to remember a single password. And it just blows my mind how aggravated people get about passwords, but yet they refuse to do the one thing that it will take to solve that problem. And people are also have a similar attitude toward multi-factor uh, authentication. It's true. Uh, which, which is probably the safest way to navigate the internet these days. And people are like, oh, I don't want to do this because then I got to get a text or, you know, this sort of thing. You're like, I, I don't know. Look at the, you know, look at all the, the uh, security compromises out there. Uh, you know, take your take your choice, but I mean, multi-factor is just such an obvious thing to do, and people resist it like like nothing else. Well, like you say, uh, like you said before we started recording the podcast, uh, it may be that a year from now everything will be Face ID and we don't have to remember another password again. So maybe that's what all my friends are holding out for is the day when we when we are in a post-password era and maybe, maybe they will uh, have the last laugh on me. Dennis, anything to wrap it up or are we ready to move on? 
No, I think we can move on. You want to take it away? Let's move on. But let me just say that uh, if you thought this was sort of our negative episode, stay tuned for the next episode. We'll be talking about something a little bit more uplifting, a little bit more thankful, and, uh, and we'll have a lot of fun with that episode as well. Before we move on to our next segment, however, let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsor. Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screened process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy. And I'm Tom Mile. We love to make our B segment available to people who have questions. We've got a number, as you remember, for a special voicemail box for you to leave audio questions or make suggestions for topics. That number is 720-441-6820. That's 720-441-6820. We would love to use your question in our B segment in a future episode. We've actually, for this B segment, have a response to our last podcast about document assembly uh, with a great tip. So let's go to to the tape for that tip. Hi, my name is Melissa Church. Um, this really isn't a question. It's more of a comment on your uh, recent episode on document assembly. You mentioned hot docs and the high price of uh, developing templates. I think it would behoove many of the users if you would mention the hot docs marketplace where there are pre-developed templates for uh, that are priced often at a, at a level where a solo and small firm can uh, buy in and get the advantage of the very highly logical uh, coding that goes into developing the templates for hot docs market. Um, as far as document assembly programs go, hot docs does seem to be have a far more robust um, logic capabilities. And I think it's important for solo and small firms to know that they can get professionally developed templates at an affordable price at a hot docs market. You can reach me at area code 803-327-4600. Thank you. I think it's a really great tip that we actually, I'll say for me, totally forgot about when we were talking about document assembly. Dennis, uh, do you have any experience with that hot docs market? I don't, but I also know that we had somebody associated with Hot Docs Marketplace also leave us a, a voicemail about it. And I, I think it's, uh, I just think it's a terrific idea because I, the thing about document assembly that we talked about is is trying to eliminate or reduce friction. And so the fact that, that you could use templates or approaches that basically do some of the common things that you want to do that are made available to you or that you can tweak a little bit really knocks down the, the learning curve and can give you something to start with right away so you can you can start to see some benefits or do some practice with it or see see how it it might help you I think if you get you know, when you look at the the hot docs type of training, um, I think it can really feel overwhelming. I mean, you see the benefit, but you kind of see how to do it. Just it can seem like it's more than you want to get into. So I think to have something like this marketplace, really, if people start to use it, will will move us forward in in document assembly. And and uh, so so I think it's I think it's a great thing. And it was as you said, time is a is a great tip that we probably should have covered in the podcast. Yep. And, and I, what I really love about this is all the templates are already customized to use with Hot Docs, which is, I think, the benefit of this market. You you get templates that fit your own state requirements, and you don't have to do a thing, basically. Uh, but the, the you know the marketplace itself is actually a, a couple of different things. You can you can purchase a subscription to a bundle of templates for your state. So, for example, uh, the New Jersey bundle offers you 544 templates for 344 dollars a year, which is for, I mean that's 60 cents a year, 60 cents per document that you get. I think that's an amazing price to get a template that you hopefully are going to use uh, multiple times uh, in your practice. Um, you can also actually become a publisher. You can publish and sell your own forms online if you want. Most of the providers now are professional publishers, but I don't know that they prevent anybody from publishing their own templates as long as they meet certain criteria. Uh, now, we just learned today as we're recording that Hot Docs has been purchased uh, by a new company, so not sure whether that will affect the marketplace going forward, but 
right now, there's more than 10,000 templates in 27 different bundles. I mean, frankly, there are some states that have over 1,000 templates, which I've got to believe is anything that a lawyer would ever need to have a template for. And I, I think that's really a no-brainer to, to use Hot Docs and, and subscribe to these bundles uh, to start making use of this document assembly. Yeah, so I think if you already own Hot Docs and haven't quite figured out what to do with it, this is the place, the Hot Docs marketplace is the place uh, to go next to, and that, I think that will help you get moving forward with your projects. So now it's time for our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation you can use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. All right, I have a couple uh, of quick parting shots. The first is is that we're recording this uh, about a week or two after the iPhone 10 was released, and for some reason, the notch that appears at the top of the screen, the dark space that uh, you don't actually see where the rest of the screen is lit up, seems to be a point of some uh, controversy. And so what's been interesting to me is that over the past week or so, um, apps have appeared in the uh, Apple App Store to try and deal with the notch, including one app called Notch Remover, which basically makes the whole top of your screen dark. And this was actually approved by Apple. So you can actually change the aesthetic of the iPhone 10 and it's approved by Apple. There's another one called Nacho, which I thought was kind of a funny name, that allows you to create your own wallpaper that takes away the notch. So if uh, you are an iPhone 10 user and that notch is getting to you, then there is help for you in the App Store. Um, and because I can't let, seem to let an episode go by without talking about headphones or speakers, Speakers. Uh, here's my regular speaker update. I just actually today in the mail got my pair of the Google Pixel Buds, which have the translator built directly into them and the Google Assistant built into them. Um, it's They're an interesting pair of headphones. They're a little more expensive than I would like, $159, but you can actually have the Google Translator translate directly into your ears as someone else is talking and speaking a different language. And, and I think that that's going to be the killer feature for these particular earbuds that you can travel to a foreign country and have somebody speak into your phone and in your ears you're going to have stuff translated as if you were at the United Nations or something like that. I'm really intrigued by by these and we would be looking forward to using them. The Google Pixel earbuds are available at the Google Store online. So Tom, in your will, have you named a, a special executor for speakers and headphones? I don't keep them all. I, I make uh, I make bequests of them frequently after I'm done using them. Ah, okay. Well, I, I have two, also a quick one. So, so one is a Chrome extension. Uh, so it's a library extension. I think it's is all it's called. And what it does is that when you're you're looking at books, say on Amazon or any of the other bookstores, you lets you do like a quick check to see if it's available at your public library, either as a you know a regular book or, or as an ebook. And so if you know if if you're not sure you want to spend thirty dollars on a book and it's in your library it's a it, it's a great way to to save money and so cool thing just a, an extension you can put into the chrome browser the second one is just a great little podcast about half an hour on cybersecurity in the cybersecurity industry and the podcast is called Danny in the Valley and the episode is with someone named Orion Hindawi, who's at a cybersecurity company called Tanium. And the title of the episode says, this is a snake oil industry. And it's great on a, uh, for a number of reasons, because uh, Orion goes through a lot of security basics, talks about the history of the cybersecurity business, sort of what's coming down the pike, you know, what has worked, what hasn't, some of the things that we haven't changed and just as a, a 30 minute intro to where things are you know the current state of cybersecurity, this is it was just a really excellent introduction i feel so if cybersecurity is an interest of yours and you got a half an hour to spend this episode of, of danny in the in the valley uh podcast is a great starting point and so that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode at tkmreport.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast uh, in Apple Podcast app or on the Legal Talk Network site where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please email us at tkmreport at gmail.com. You can find us both on LinkedIn. And if you remember, we've got that number for voicemail questions. We love to take voicemail questions. That number is 720-441-6820. 
So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy, and you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us on Apple Podcasts, and we'll see you the next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.